way. And this morning, this evening, we are going to the book of the Revelation. If you turn with me to the book of the Revelation to begin with, chapter number 19. Revelation chapter number 19. And we will continue looking at our series on knowing God, looking at the different attributes of the Lord in His Word. Of course, there's much more that can be said for each of these subjects. But I uh, trust that these truths will encourage you to continue to learn more of the Lord. Revelation chapter 19, verse number 6. Welcome to the church in Mauritius as well. who will be joining us later. And I hope it's a little bit warmer over there in the tropics. <laughs> I think it's currently 5 degrees outside. So uh, that's why we're all rugged up. But... Uh, Praise the Lord for the technology. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let's pray. Father, as we pray to you this evening, we Confess that we do not know you as we ought to. Yes. Lord, we need you to revive us again. Amen. We need you, Lord, to open our eyes that we may see who you are according to your word. Uh, Lord, take away the, the, uh, the fear and the doubt and uh, the, uh, Lord, experiences of this day. Lord, help us to grow in our faith as we look to you afresh this evening. Please teach us from your word uh, the truth of your omnipotence, of your almighty power, so, Lord, we may trust you uh, like the believers of old did and were mighty in faith and strong in faith and faithfully served you in their day. Lord, help us, we pray, and bless this time now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to look at the second part of our message on the God of absolute power, part number two. And uh, we looked at this subject a few weeks ago, and um, this evening we are going to continue it. And here in verse number six, we actually read the word omnipotent at the end of the verse. And that's the big word we use to describe God's power. Now, this word is also translated elsewhere in the Bible as almighty, nine times. The word almighty is used. So the word omnipotent, the word almighty are the same. And, uh, and it reminds us that our God is all powerful. And he is able to do whatever he wills in exactly the way he wills it. Now, again, these truths are so important for us, aren't they? Because they shape our belief of God, our view of God. And our view of God shapes everything we do and respond to in our lives. Of course, as I've mentioned before, without God's power, his promises would be ridiculous. Why? Because he would not have the power to keep those promises. God promises in his word, doesn't he, that he can do the impossible. Is that correct? That nothing is impossible with God. But if he was powerless, therefore he could never keep his promises. Well, we can depend on God because he is able. And if uh, you can remember anything tonight, uh, because he is able... That's why you and I can remain stable. Isn't that right? Because God is able, no matter what we face, no matter what He allows, we can remain stable. We can remain strong in our faith. Last time we looked at one area of God's power, which was His power over all creation. You remember we looked at the book of Genesis, how that all God had to do was to speak and the universe came into existence. Scientists are still unable to fathom 
the intricacies of our infinite universe and yet God just spoke. That is the extent of the greatness of his power. It is beyond our understanding. Uh, Moses, you remember, we looked at his example and how he doubted whether God could use him to be his messenger, to be his servant, to go back to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And do you remember we learned how God revealed himself as the great I am and then practically showed Moses how great he really is. And uh, he said, you know, uh, what is that in thine hand? And Moses said, it's a rod and he cast it down and it became a serpent. And then he picked it up by the tail and it became a rod once again. And so God revealed to Moses the greatness of his power. And he reminded Moses that he is the one that will do the miraculous. And he simply needs to trust in him. Well, ultimately, Moses feared the Lord and he packed his bags and he went off to Egypt and the rest is history. So we saw God's power in creation. And secondly, tonight, we want to look at God's power over all authority. And let's have a look in Romans chapter 13. And I think I know why we are doing part two now, because uh, I think it's a bit better after the elections are over to look at the fact that God is all powerful over all all authority. Romans chapter 13, notice verses 1 and 2. Romans 13 verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We will look at those verses a little bit closer, but first notice that every authority, every earthly authority, prime minister, president, every leader in government, whether they are good or whether they are evil, are all under the power of God. We see that in the Bible. We see that uh, though God, of course, is not the author of evil and he does not do any evil, the Bible tells us that God used men like Pharaoh. He used men like Nebuchadnezzar. He used men like Cyrus and even Herod himself to accomplish his plans. Now, how did he do that? How did he use such wicked men to his own purposes. Well, these men thought that they were working out their own plans in their own day. But God in his power was supernaturally overruling their plans in order to do his will in the earth. How is that possible? It's possible because God is almighty. He's able to overrule. He is able to turn hearts He's even able to bend the will of man in order for them to fulfill his will, though they are wicked in their ways. That's what the Bible teaches us. It does not connect God with evil, but it shows us how great God's power is to overrule evil and turn it for his glory. God and his power is supernaturally able to do that. That is the power of God. The Bible says in verse 1, once again, of chapter 13, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, sometimes we look at the world, and we often look at the world, and we say, well, this world is out of control. Uh, Isn't that what we see on the news? Uh, But is that actually true? Is that actually a right God-given thought? Well, it's a human thought. It is a very real thought. It's a very natural thought. But the reality is, if God is all-powerful, then He is always in control. Amen? And perhaps one of the greatest examples in the Bible of the sovereign power of God at work is in the life of Joseph. The life of Joseph. Turn to Genesis chapter 50. While we talk a little bit about the life of Joseph, Genesis chapter 50. Now think about Joseph. 
I'm sure as he was growing up in his father's home, in Jacob's house, he was just like any other young man. You know, he uh, had dreams, he had plans for the future. Uh, you know, there were probably things he wanted to do with his life. There were probably some foods that he enjoyed eating, uh, probably some talents that he had that uh, maybe are not revealed to us in the Old Testament. But he was a young man. He was a single young adult. And, uh, you know, he had his life in front of him. But suddenly he was overcome by the power of his brothers. Do you remember that? Now, he was just doing what his dad wanted him to do. He went out to see how his brothers were and to give a report on what, what they were up to. Sadly, they were up to wickedness and evil. And uh, when they saw him coming, he was overcome by their power. They, they planned to kill him, but instead, of course, they sent Joseph to Egypt as a slave. And from that point onwards, would you agree that Joseph lost all power? to make any decisions that he wanted to for his life. Um, the reality is he'd, he lost everything. Uh, what does that mean? Well, as a young man, he had no power, no right, no freedom to plan his own future anymore. He was now a slave. Uh, we just take for granted that we could eat just what we want. You know, whatever your favorite food is or whatever you could eat or can eat or wanted to eat today, you did eat. But for Joseph, suddenly... That freedom was gone. He had to eat what he was given to eat. Strange food in a strange land. He had to wear what he was given to wear. And I dare say what the Egyptians wore wasn't honoring to the Lord. Imagine his struggle with that. He had to speak a language he had never spoken before and to learn it in order to do his duties. All his future plans were suddenly snuffed out. And taken away. No rights, no freedom, and of course, as a slave, he had no power. He was under authority. And then he was at the power of Potiphar and his wife. Now, you remember his wife accused him of immorality and tried to discredit him, and he had no power to defend his innocence because he was a slave. He couldn't speak for himself. So he was thrown into prison and he was there for years, the Bible tells us. Well, the butler and the baker came along and he interpreted their dreams and he was right. The dream was from the Lord, but even then he was forgotten and he had to wait for years. Then he was under the power of Pharaoh. Pharaoh took him out of prison he asked Joseph to interpret the dream, and here's just a little different perspective. He then said to Joseph, well, since you interpreted my dream correctly, I'm appointing you as the man to oversee this great task of collecting the food to make sure we don't starve from the three years of famine. Uh, I don't see in the scriptures Pharaoh asking Joseph if he's up to the job. I don't see Pharaoh asking Joseph, would you like to serve in this ministry like perhaps your pastor would? Uh, I don't see Joseph being asked whether he would like to uh, uh, marry uh, the, the, uh, the priest of On, On's daughter um, and, and take her to be his wife. He was still under the power of Pharaoh, would you agree? But even though his brothers, Potiphar, the prison guard, Pharaoh himself, all these authorities had great power to control Joseph's life and it might seem from their actions that they were in complete control. We know that God was using them to accomplish his plans. Isn't that right? What an example. What a wonderful encouragement. What a reminder for us today that no matter who is in authority, brethren, God is almighty. He is still on the throne and he is still overruling in the affairs of men. That ought to give us great encouragement. That ought to keep us stable when we live in such a fearful and wicked world. You see, the truth of who God is, I believe, kept Joseph stable all those years. 
You know, Joseph knew uh, something about God, didn't he? He knew some things about God. Obviously, he did. Because those in Egypt recognized he was a man of God. Pharaoh himself said, who else in the land uh, could be like this one who has the spirit of God in him? Pharaoh could see it. We know that God gave Joseph a dream, didn't he? And, and Joseph knew that as this vision was given to him, this was a promise of God. The sheaves bowing down were no doubt his brothers. The sun, moon and stars were no doubt his parents. So Joseph knew that God had a great plan for him. Something great was going to happen. He may not have known all the details, but I dare say this truth of who God is, that he is almighty, kept him stable all those years, especially when everything seemed to be going wrong. Do we ever find Joseph fighting against authority and seeking vengeance? Yes or no? No, we don't. Do we find Joseph ever in despair and depressed? Now, he could have been. I noted in the, in the prison, he, in frustration, you know, he said to the baker and the butler, I, I, I'm innocent. I didn't commit this crime. I shouldn't be in here. Can you please talk to the Pharaoh? Uh, I mean, this, this young man was, was uh, just like you and I. You know, he would get frustrated. Uh, you know, he would plead his case, but he never was downcast and discouraged and depressed and cynical about God. In fact, in the prison, God spoke to Joseph. God's power was still working in his life. Imagine when he was the second in authority in Egypt. Imagine what would have happened if Joseph was a bitter man, an angry man, a vengeful man. Imagine the day his brothers turned up and now finally in a position of power, what he could have done. Imagine if he decided to take revenge. What would have happened to the line of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel? What would have happened to this young man? Well, thank God he knew God and he did not take revenge. And here in chapter 50 and verse number 20, we read the wonderful verse, which is really the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Let's read it together on two. One, two. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Can you see Joseph's faith? He knew who God was. He knew the power of God. He understood the plan of God. He knew that God overruled their evil against him, but God's plan was to mean it for good, and God is the one in his almighty power that brought it to pass. Amen? Wow. You see, knowing God brings peace to our souls. And that's what we need. We need to be revived in our faith in who God is and to trust Him according to His Word. Many times we are very unstable, aren't we? Um, the psalmist says, Be not afraid of sudden fears. In fact, that's when I'm most afraid, when they come suddenly. How can I not be afraid of sudden fears? Well, because if we know who our God is, we may respond in a different way when fears come suddenly. As we turn back to the book of Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13. Now let's look at this issue of power over authority. In Romans chapter 13, the Bible instructs us to be subject unto the higher powers. Why? Well, as we've already learned, God is in control. So because God is in control and there is no power but of God, therefore the powers that be are ordained of God. No matter who is in government, ultimately God is upon the throne. Ultimately God is almighty. And many Christians struggle with this, and rightly so. 
when there are so many wicked decisions being made by our government, it's easy to become cynical. It's easy to become bitter. It's easy to become angry if we forget who God is. You know, it's easy to lose our testimony. Uh, Further down, the Bible says in verse 7, Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so we need to be careful as Christians to obey the word of God because God is the one who ultimately is in power. And he wants us to honor authority. He wants us to not be critical Christians, ones who are bitter, ones who complain, uh, Christians who don't pay tax, Christians who speak of politicians uh, without respect, without uh, consideration of their position or of the word of God, Christians who are rebellious. I'm glad we're going to uh, hand out tracks on Saturday in Garima Place and not wave flags around and protest against the government. Amen? Why aren't we protesting against the government? There, are, there is a lot of things we could protest about. Why aren't we? Because God is on the throne. That's why. Because God is almighty. And we need to be preaching the gospel. But there are Christians out there whose chief business is to vent their anger at the government their frustrations, and there are consequences when we neglect the knowledge of God, when we reject the power of God. The Bible says in verse number two, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. The word damnation there refers to judgment. You know, there are consequences when we don't obey the Lord. There are. Uh, First of all, our own sins will reprove us if we're just full of anger. If we're full of anger and bitterness and frustration towards the government and we don't rest in the promise of God's almighty power and that he's overruling no matter what vote and decision took place a few weeks ago, if we are angry Christians, that will take a toll on our body. That will take a toll on our mind. Our body will start to suffer physically and and that fear and never-ending exhaustion of heart and body and trying to take control and keep control of our lives will not sustain us. We begin to break down mentally. We begin to break down physically as if it's ever possible for us to control what's happening in our country. You know, you probably voted one way and you may be disappointed that it didn't go the way you voted. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yes, sir. I mean, we all had some plans and, and uh, how did this happen? Well, God is on the throne. That is our stabilizing truth for tonight. Amen? Amen? Look, we don't need to sit at home and debate with our children and talk about the ins and outs of politics. Aren't there better things to talk about? Amen? Amen? Our God is overruling and that not one issue in God's historical plan for this day has been destroyed by what man has done because God is almighty. His power over authority is absolute. And let's uh, look in Psalm 103, Psalm 103 verse 19. I hope we're still friends this evening. (laughs) This is not a political message, but such an important truth. You know, God doesn't want us to be passive Christians, by the way. It doesn't mean we should just sit back and say, look, everything will be right. She'll be right, mate. You know, that is not a spiritual statement. Uh, The fact that God is in control helps us to be strong in faith, helps us to have confidence in strange and wicked days, helps us to trust Him and not in the arm of the flesh, helps us to respect our government and, uh, and as long as they don't prevent us from obeying the Word of God, then we are able to honor what we are led to do. Psalm 103 verse number 19, 
the Bible says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. God has absolute power, which means he has the absolute right to do as he pleases. And again, this is another wonderfully comforting truth. His kingdom ruleth over all. Who, will, who is ruling over all? all? God is. God is ruling over all. And we don't need to fear that anything can happen to us. And uh, the only way that anything um, can happen to us, that perhaps we fear can happen, cannot happen without God's direct approval. Amen? That's the difference between, between, between being saved and being unsaved. Is there a difference? Should we be fearing just as much as before we were lost? And should we be panicking? And should we be, we be worrying? Uh, no, we shouldn't. We should be confident. We should be at peace. We should be at rest no matter what's happening to us. Especially when... It doesn't seem God is in control. Think about Joseph. You know, he lived in dark days. Uh, the children of Jacob were in rebellion against God, weren't they? They were not godly men at all. And uh, though God's people rebelled against God's revealed will, they could never change the will of God. God was in control all along. And so Joseph could rejoice. So let's rejoice as God's people. Amen that He has put us here for such a time as this. We have a job to do. Yes, we will be cursed. Yes, we will be looked at as the off-scoring, as Paul said, the off-scouring of the filth of the world. But God knows what He's doing. Souls still are being saved. Amen. The gospel is still going forward. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, is standing on the edge of eternity, ready to descend from heaven with a shout. And we need to have faith in who He is. Because the Lord will try our faith. And there will be, there will be challenges, testings, fears, and sudden fears that will come. Think about how you reacted recently when you were afraid. Would you have responded differently? if you remembered your almighty God. We ought to not only know who He is, but as a result, we ought to praise Him. As we turn back to the verses we began with, let's close there in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We read verse number 6. Notice verse number 5. What will we be doing for all eternity? Well, Revelation 19 tells us, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye His servants, and ye that fear Him, both small and great. And that's exactly what they did. What did they praise Him for in verse number 6? And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. We will be praising Him for His almighty power. And may God give us the faith to praise Him now. Amen. To praise Him for His power. Let's have that faith. When something does not go according to our plans, when we are suddenly shaken, uh, may that shaking just shake off the unbelief. Amen? And may what remains be uh, gold, faith in the Lord, in His power, believing He is in control, believing He's working all things together for good. And let us praise Him before we see Him. Let's pray. Father, we need you to put this truth down into our lives.
Lord, we need you to help us when we are afraid. Lord, forgive us for doubting you and for looking to things below and not to things above. Lord, to believe that you are almighty seems so obvious and yet we so rarely respond with that kind of faith. Lord, forgive us for not believing your word. Help our unbelief and may your Holy Spirit uh, bring your word to mind the next time we are in a position where we doubt your workings in our lives. Thank you for the example of Joseph and his steadfast faith. Lord, help us to live for you in this day and help us to praise you before a lost world who desperately needs to see Christ in us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here and for your attention. Look forward to seeing you on the weekend. God bless.